All right. Well, Friday. Happy Sabbath. Welcome back to our Friday night Bible study. Uh, this week, uh, we're starting Revelation 14. I should say we're studying Revelation 14 because we're not breaking it up. We're going to do it all in one night. Uh, before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come together virtually here to study your word. We ask, Lord, that you will be with us in this study. Guide us in our discussion. Lead us to the truth that you have hidden in your word. Thank you for asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can tell from the picture, this is the chapter that has the three angels message in it, which uh, Mark Finley devoted most of the chapter to. And the last time we did a Revelation study, uh, we broke this up into three parts. We're not doing that this time. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to spend three hours on this chapter. Just that we're going to do kind of a quick overview on some of this. Uh, there we go. Slides were slow to change. All right, so Revelation chapter 14, God's final message, Earth's final harvest. Oh, now it's trying to catch up. Okay. There we go. All right, so in Revelation 12, uh, that revealed Satan wages war on God's people. It was all about Satan waging war. Revelation 13, which we studied the last two uh, evenings, revealed that worship is a central issue in that war. And then in Revelation 14, God sends angels with a threefold message to the entire world, calling their attention to the issue of worship and calling them back to the true worship. This is the last big uh, push the last messages from God before the end and then when we get into chapter 15 and 16 in those two chapters we'll actually move into the last day events involving the seven last plagues but for this week we're focusing on Revelation 14 and it is split into three parts which is why last time we did this we broke the chapter into three parts in our study uh, there's the first part, the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion. Second part is the three angels and the three messages. And the third part is Earth's final harvest. Now, I could easily spend an hour on each of those, but we're not going to do that. We're going to start off with 144,000. Instead of going into a lot of detail, we're just going to hit the main points on this and then push through to the meat of the chapter of focus, which is the, the last day messages, the three angels message. Let's start off taking a look at the verses that talk about the 144,000. This is Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5. Gary, you want to start us off? Sure. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the many waters and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harp playing their harps. They sang as if it were a new song before the, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song, the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth, the ones who were not defiled with women virgins they are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes are redeemed from among the men being first fruits to god and to the lamb and in their mouth was found no deceit for they are without fault before god thank you dear now let's ask the obvious question first is this number given literal or symbolic Symbolic. Yeah. Symbolic. All right. So we remember the rule, right? In Revelation, unless it tells you otherwise, you assume it's symbolic. The rest of the Bible, if you're reading it, unless it tells you what otherwise, you assume it's literal. Revelation, you flip that. And that's because the, the chapter is almost all symbolism. And John makes that very clear in chapter one as we study. All right. So. It's a symbolic number, which is good news. 
for us because we know when you read through here it talked about them being sealed right they had god's name written on their forehead we know that's how the people are sealed just before the end so if there were only 144,000 people sealed that's not very many people in a planet with how many billion yeah what eight billion now i think eight billion now yeah so that's a lot i know uh i <laughs> preached a sermon where i touched on this last year and I, we did the numbers like if you did that as a percentage of whatever the population of the world is right now in the city the size of indianapolis we would end up with like 14 people i think, I think yeah something like that if if we were if it was a literal number and we just took the percentages so obviously that's not going to be the case right so the next question is who are the 144,000? Well, what does the text tell us? This his father's name is written on their yeah. foreheads. But it says in verse 3 the end of verse 3 what does it say? They were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are redeemed from the earth. So these are the ones who come through the time of trouble at the end and are redeemed. Now, verse four said, what does it mean that they are virgins? Because it says here that they are virgins. These are ones. They're not defiled. It says not defiled with women. Now, again, this is symbolic. So in the Bible, what when it's talking about virgins it's talking about that in contrast to say a woman who's impure which the bible often uses the term harlot and you're going to see that a lot here a little bit later in revelation too so what does a harlot represent in revelation a false church or a state church right or yeah that's you get that a lot in the old testament uh israel was often depicted as a harlot because they were unfaithful to god mm -hmm. right so and the whole book of hosea is all yeah. about that <laughs> how uh, the the nation of israel was playing the harlot and uh hosea bless his heart god actually had him marry a harlot but um it, it's interesting so the virgin in contrast to that would be a church who was faithful who was pure uh, who was obedient to god and true to form that's all we're going to hit on the 144,000. <laughs> so if you want more on that if you're watching this uh, online if you go back to our webs uh, our facebook page there's uh, in our prior study, uh, the keys to, the, to uh, Revelation, there's a chap, a whole study there on the 144,000 goes into great detail. That's all we're doing tonight because Pastor Finley kind of rushes right through it to get to the meat, which is the three angels' mage messages. Right. First off, does God always give ample warning before sending judgment? Yes. 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 Can you think of some examples from the Bible? Noah in the ark. Noah in the ark. How much warning did he give the people before he sent the flood? 120 years. Yeah. 120 years. Is that ample warning? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But how many people got on the ark with Noah? With eight people seven. total. Yeah. Seven out of them. Right. It's just his family, right? Nobody else. Yeah. His sons, their wives, and his wife. And that was it. All right. So the the fact that not many people will respond to the warning doesn't deter God from giving the warning anyway. He knows who's going to hear it. He knows who's not going to. He's going to listen and who's not going to. But uh, he still gives them the chance to make the choice. Um, so that's a good thing. We have a God who believes in free will. And the good news is he's not going to force that decision on you. Can we think of some other examples? What are some other warnings? Mm -hmm. Examples of warnings. Jonah. Jonah. 
Hey, yeah, Jonah. They, they, <laughs> eventually, I mean, he set up the war in the city. The, um, he went, he went and he preached in the city of Nineveh. Now, unlike Noah, Noah had the longest evangelistic series in history with zero converts. <laughs> Jonah had a short one. He walked from one end of town to the other. I think he said three days. Three days. Three days. And the whole city repented. Mm-hmm. So that was uh, that was something. Now, when he was given the warning, how many days? Do you recall how many days he was telling them before judgment would be delivered on them if they didn't repent? Was it forty? Forty days. So again, God gave them ample time to repent. Now it didn't take them forty days to do that. They did it pretty quickly. Um, Follow the example of their king, I believe. All right, any other examples from the Bible? Well, I'm going through patriarchs and prophets with David Asherick, and there's warning after warning after warning. After warning after warning. <laughs> oh, yeah. All through the book yeah. of Judges. <laughs> is loaded. Israel yeah. is faithful for a little bit. Then they fall off the track. God sends them a, a warning message. So they, he brings them back. They're faithful for a while. And then they fall off the track again. And he did that yeah. over and over and over again. Pleading with yeah. them. So definitely. And then all through the uh, Old Testament, from Daniel on, uh, when you have the minor prophets, he's calling Israel back to faithfulness. Because remember, Daniel now, the, the, the clock started ticking for the Jewish nation. Yeah. yeah. And here's God's final plea towards the end of the Old Testament to have these people come back to him. All right. So the Bible is just filled with examples. And there's more, but we're going to keep moving. All right. So how are these warnings generally generally received? Let's look at Matthew 23, 37. And Carmen, read that for us. I promise we're going to get into the next few verses of Revelation soon. <laughs> Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. What does this verse tell us about how the warnings are generally received? It's ignored. ignored. Largely, is what did the, what did these verses say that he did? They did to the prophets. Them. They killed, killed them. them. They killed them. Killed God's messengers. And, but yet, what did was God wanting to do? He was wanting to gather them under His wings like chicks. So that's you know. God's attitude towards us in comparison to our attitude towards God, but yet God continues to plead. So why does he continue to send these messages if they're generally rejected? Let's go to the book for this, page 316, third paragraph. It says, throughout history, God allowed sin to continue for only so long before his judgments fall. Although he has created us with the freedom of choice, he is sovereign. Our choices can never supersede his overall plan for this world. Sin and rebellion have their limits. Oh, that was paragraph four. That's paragraph four. That's a good paragraph. The paragraph four, that's what I meant to read. God is feeling that same emotion as he sends these urgent messages to earth. Many times his spirit has pled with men and women to turn to him and be saved. As the end rapidly approaches, Satan is enraged against God's people. The beast power is demanding worship. People must decide where they stand, and God does everything he can to encourage them to come to him. He has promised to be with them to the very end. He looks ahead to the time when the 144,000 will stand with the Lamb on Mount Zion. He wants as many as possible to be among that group. And the interesting thing here is you can see the comparison. God pleads, tries to persuade, but what does Satan do? He demands and enforces. 
Right? He yeah. uses force. God will never use force. I think Annabelle is joining us. All right, so now we can move into the next section, which is the message of the first angel. This is found in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And Kim, if you could read that for us. Okay. And what am I reading here? Sorry, my sisters. Uh, Revelation <laughs> 14, verses uh, yeah. 6 and 7. Okay. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. All right, so what is this first angel preaching? What's his message? Um, that the hour of judgment God glory. Yeah. Right. Give God the glory to worship, <laughs> worship God. Yeah. And, and his hour of judgment has come. And the judgment has come, right? So it's calling people back to worship the creator, but it's also warning of the judgment. So let's take a look at uh, page 317, paragraphs one and two. I can't mess this one up because they're at the top of the page, right? Notice what his first angel is preaching. This angel has the everlasting gospel. Now, if it's the everlasting gospel, how long has it been around? How long will it be around? Forever. Forever, Forever right? It doesn't change. It's the same in Genesis as it is in Revelation all the way through. So he's, uh, this angel has the everlasting gospel to preach to those living on earth. He is not preaching some new gospel. The angel doesn't try to shape the gospel to meet the current whims or fads of society. Right? Anytime you see the church trying to do that, beware. Right? The angel preaches a gospel that is everlasting. It's the same gospel that Paul and the other apostles preached in the first century. It's the same gospel that Luther preached in the Reformation. It's the same gospel that the Bible has been teaching since the beginning. The beauty of the gospel is that it appeals to the hearts and minds of every generation. Society may change, but the deepest needs of our fundamental lives remain essentially the same. At the end of time, the fundamental need of people everywhere is to hear the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Boy, we need to hear that today. There is no path to salvation except through the cross. So the foundation of God's threefold appeal to earth in the last days is the everlasting gospel. Now, there are some parts to this. The angel emphasizes four points, which it brings out in the book. And we're going to discuss those. First, it says to fear God. What does it mean to fear God? To honor. To revere him and respect him. Revere, respect. So those are some, some uh, good words. Those are all good things, right? Well, let's see if we can figure out, based on a couple of texts in the Bible, what fearing God means. So let's look first at Deuteronomy 6.2. And Nicole's going to read that. And uh, then Annabelle, if you'd like to read, if you can get ready for Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Well, that's it. 12, 13, 13 14. and 14. You have three and four. I have what on the worksheet? Oh, I'm, well, I wonder if I typed that wrong. I'm going to look that one up real quick, Annabella. It may be supposed to be three and 14. I have it wrong on my screen. I was going to read Deuteronomy 6 2. Yeah, go ahead. Deuteronomy 6, verse 2. That you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you. You and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. All right. So, what does fear of God indicate there? So, obedience to yeah, obedience. Yeah. That's it. All right. Now, that's a result of fearing God, is obedience. Now, Ecclesiastes 12. Twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Yeah, it is supposed to be thirteen and fourteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. 
Okay, uh, let us hear the conclusion of the whole ma matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret, secret thing, whether good or evil. So if you honor God and you respect God and you revere God, how do you display that in your life? By keeping his commandments. his commandments. By keeping his commandments, right? You're going to obey him, right? Is it possible to revere, respect, and honor a king and then disobey his laws? No. no that's disrespectful, right? Yeah. It's like having a child living in your house and, dis and uh, disobeying your house rules, right? That's disrespectful. So we get back to fear God. There's also on page 318, I'm going to read a paragraph, number two, I think, it says, heaven's urgent appeal is for those saved by grace to live godly lives. Grace does not free us from obeying the commands of God. However, if we fail, we can come in humble repentance, confessing our sins, and he graciously pardons us. That's why the Apostles Paul states so emphatically in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The gospel not only delivers us from the guilt of our past, but also empowers us to live godly, obedient lives in the present. The Apostle Paul declares of believers, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. That's Romans 1, 5. We fear God when we stand in awe of his goodness, marvel at his grace, and are overwhelmed with his love. All right, and that's important that we understand that because there are so many churches today that, that actually teach it's impossible to obey God's laws in this life which is just the opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that it is possible through Christ to live a sinless life. Now, it doesn't mean that you haven't sinned before, but it is possible going forward to live without sinning. Right. Now, number two, the second point, it says, give glory to him, right? So we're supposed to be giving glory to who? God. Yeah. God, right? Not trying to haul glory for ourselves. So how can we give glory to God? There are some ways. Um. <laughs> well, it says allowing him to demonstrate his grace and power in our lives, I guess, by the way we live. By the way we live. Mm -hmm. yep. and that can be a powerful testimony especially if people who've known you all your life and they knew how you were before and then they see that change and how you were after um, I mean it's it's really funny when uh, we moved up here to Tennessee of course we got away from people we'd known all our lives so we just talk or chat on the phone and then we went to see him in person and they saw the changes that i had gone through physically <laughs> as you know all i went through and, uh, i know my sister says well i can't believe i have a skinny brother <laughs> i remember that you remember that, <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. My, my brother's not skinny <laughs> he's not <laughs> but and she hadn't had a skinny brother since high school. So, yeah, since I was in high school. At that point in time, she was in the... It's been quite a, quite a change. And when you're, the way you live changes, people who know you will notice. And you give glory to God that way. So how we live uh, and get, can glorify God and how we live can also dishonor God. So it's important to keep those straight. 
Now we have some text that we're going to look up on how to give glory to him. Because I don't want it to just be, you know, this is what Bob said we, we do. This is what is in the Bible. So let's look at Romans 12, 1. And we're back up to Jerry. And then Carmen, if you can uh, be ready with 1 Corinthians 3.17. Romans 12, 1 would be first. For me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Jerry, whenever you're ready. Okay. Boy, that's not the wrong one. Hold on a second, guys. <laughs> Let him have it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, a reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what good and acceptable and perfect will of god i think i read a little bit more that's okay <laughs> they kind of go together so that's fine the the big one i wanted to point out though it was in verse 12 I mean, chapter 12, verse 1, yeah. It says, present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Holy acceptable to God. So it's talking here. Now, is it talking about just your physical body? No. Mm -hmm. It's talking about all I aspects you. of your life. Right. The Bible is talking about people. It talks about them holistically. So it's talking about physical uh mental spiritual it all into one but how do you present your body a living sacrifice what's a sacrifice you're giving stuff up so you, in essence you'd probably a lot of everything for what god would want you to do and not what you personally just feel like doing at the time or something. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, a lot of people look at it as you're giving something up, which is not necessarily uh, completely, you know, the whole picture here. You may stop partaking of certain things, but what God gives you in place of that ultimately is better, uh, which it takes a little bit of time to get used to it, obviously, uh, because you're used to one thing. That Satan has a lot of addictive things in this world that people get used to. And I'm not talking about just necessarily, you know, like chemical compounds that we may imbibe in one form or another. It could be a show you watch on TV or um, just something else, some other entertainment. But there's lots of ways that he can hook you. But by giving those things up and living for God, God fills those uh, with something else so you're not just giving something up you're getting something in return you're exchanging but uh and notice it said here at the end of verse one it says which is your reasonable service so it's not saying that you're doing this to earn anything you've already been given something so this is just a service you'd be doing to show your appreciation for it, right? It's not, you're not purchasing anything with that. And that's uh, another point that we need to make sure we understand. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 3.17. Corinthians 3.17. If any man defiled the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. All right, so... When it's talking here now, because we're the temple of God, and we've said that before, your, your body's God's temple. And so, of course, it's talking about the whole person. And it says, what happens here if you defile the temple? God will destroy it. God will destroy you, right? So he wants you to take care of your body. Talking physically, mentally, spiritually, socially. He wants you to be whole. And uh, there are consequences if you choose not to do that. So one way you give glory to him is, of course, taking care of yourself. 
Now let's read uh, page 319, first paragraph. It says, when God is the center of our lives, our one desire is to give glory to him in every aspect of our lives. Whether that has to do with our diet, the things we eat, our dress and the things we wear, our entertainment and the things we view, or our music and the things we listen to. We give glory to God as we reveal his character of love to the world through lives committed to doing his will. This becomes even more important in the light of the earth's end time judgment. And it's important. Uh, well, we'll get to that here in a minute. The judgment. But let's move on to the next thing. Point three of the four points it emphasizes here. Worship him who made heaven and earth. Now, how does this tie into the conflict we studied in chapter 13? Remember what the conflict was all about in chapter 13? Yeah, worship. Worship, worship and whom you were going to worship. Whom we were going to worship. Or we're going to worship God the way God asked us to worship him. Or were we going to worship according to the man-made rules and um, practices? Right. So here we have worship him who made heaven and earth. It's calling us back here to worship God, the creator. It's calling us all the way back to Genesis and how God established in Genesis the way he wanted to be worshiped. So let's take a look at some chapters, or not some chapters, some verses on this particular topic. Worship him who made heaven and earth. Let's go back to Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. Kim, if you could read that. Okay. Next. And then Nicole's got Ezekiel. And then Annabella would be Hebrews 4, 9, and 10. Okay. We'll start with Genesis. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. All right, so here we have God did what to the seventh day? Yeah, he blessed he it. He, he didn't just rest, right? He blessed it and sanctified it, right? So he, God, set this day aside. He sanctified it. Now, does man have the power to sanctify some other day? No. no. If God says it's this day, then that's the day, right? He's God. We can't really argue with God. All right, now let's look at Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. In verse 20, hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. All right, so notice in verse 12, it's a sign that God not only sanctifies the Sabbath, but he sanctifies us as individuals. And then in verse 20, it shows that he is God. And that's important because if you're worshiping God the way God tells you to on the day he tells you to, then you're recognizing he is God. If you're worshiping some other way, if you're following someone else's dictate, then you're acknowledging that that person is God. So it's very tricky. And now let's look at Hebrews 4, 9, and 10. Hebrews 4, 9. And 10. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Okay. You see the connection there to how God observed the Sabbath and how he calls his people to. It's not just a day for God to rest and for us to do all this work to praise him, but it's actually a, 
restful experience for us to take that time apart from the world and to give that time to God. Let's look in uh, the book, page 320. Notice a lot of these paragraphs are paragraphs one and two. Um, all right. 320 paragraphs one and two says the message of Revelation 14, God's end time message, calls us to remember the one who created us and rest in his love and care each Sabbath. So it's not just resting from physical labor, but actually resting in God. Sabbath is a symbol of rest, not of works, of grace, not legalism, of assurance, not condemnation of depending upon him and not ourselves. Each Sabbath, we rejoice in his goodness and praise him for the salvation that can be found only in Christ. The Sabbath is also the eternal link between the perfection of Eden in the past and the glory of the new heavens and new earth in the future. And we'll, we'll get to that study at the end of the book. That's going to be exciting. One day, the splendors of Eden will be restored. One day, God will create a new heaven and a new earth. One day, sickness, suffering, and sorrow will be no more. One day, disease, disaster, and death will be over. One day, joy, gladness, and peace will reign forever and ever and ever. Until that day, as we worship him with all our hearts as the creator of the heavens and earth, we rest in his everlasting love. Praise him for his grace and long for the day that he will soon return and make all things right. And uh, interesting thing, too, we, we know as we study that this mode of worshiping God will continue through eternity. Right? He's going to be honoring those Sabbaths, even in heaven and on the new earth. Right. And then the last point the first angel emphasizes is the hour of God's judgment has come. Now, we've already studied this topic quite a bit, but what judgment is this speaking of, and what does it mean that it has come? The final judgment. Yeah. All right, the final judgment, a little bit more specific. Um, what, is, what does that entail? Well, I don't know guys, the next question is... The investigative judgment. The investigative judgment. All right. So that's the uh, judgment that goes through. Now, interesting, you know, in the Bible, it says, you know, judgment starts at the house of God. This is where they're going through the records. All the people who have claimed to be followers of God. And notice that, that that's who's being investigated. Do they need to investigate the people who, who reject God? No, the no. people who openly like reject God have rejected God. So they've, they have said, look, leave me out. I don't want anything to do with your kingdom. That's their choice. He doesn't have to investigate it. Now what he has to do is say those people who said, I am a follower of God, right? Well, they, they need to be investigated to see if they can indeed be admitted, if they can be trusted uh, to live in eternity. So that's what the investigative judgment. Now, God knows who his people are, right? So it's, we, we talked about this uh, in our study on the investigative judgment. It's not for God to determine who he can trust and who he can't, because he already knows. It's for the rest of the heavenly beings. You know, say, look, if you're going to let this person in after what Satan did, you know, we got to know that we're going to be able to trust him. And that's what it's all about. Now, when it says it has come, what does that mean? Here. It's already begun. It's already started, right? So we are living yeah. in the time of that investigative judgment. Now, it starts with the people of old going all the way back to the beginning. So the people who have come and lived and died. And at some point in time, it gets to the people who are now living. We don't know that happens if it's already happened or if it is yet to happen we don't know uh but then i would imagine once we get to there it's gonna go pretty quickly uh because it, you know it's after all those thousands of years and you get to the people who are living we have pretty short lifespan so i mean it's it can't take that long i would think so the hour of god's judgment has come what will happen when this judgment is complete and what does this mean for the people of earth? 
Jesus comes when it's complete. Right. When, when the judgment's complete, that's the Jesus last thing. Right, that's it. Yeah, when that's done, we're ready. It's the second coming. So what does this mean for the people of earth right now? We need to be getting ready. Be ready. Yeah, you need to be ready. We don't know, as we said, we don't know where he is in that investigative process. We don't no. know if if he's already up to us. Mm -hmm. um, but we know he's got to be getting close to the end. Time is short, so we need to be getting ready. Now let's look at Revelation 14.8. All right, 14.8. It says, I'll read this one because I haven't really read any text yet. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, well, I'm in Romans. I'm in Romans. I'm in Romans. I'm in Romans. Yeah, excuse me. I like that verse, though. It's a good one. But no, 14.8, excuse me. <laughs> and another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, this is um, the second angel. And it's a very short message. Like one very verse. short message, one verse. Now, it's talking here about what city? Babylon. Babylon, right? What condition was the city of Babylon in at the time John wrote the book of Revelation? It wasn't in existence anymore. It had been oh, just gone. It, it was gone. ruins, right? Yeah. It had been abandoned. It was uh, desolate. It was a wilderness. Right? The only thing that went every now and then you see some nomads would pass through there, uh, shepherds and things of that nature. All right. So, what does this suggest to us about this verse? Is he talking about the literal Babylon? No. No, this is symbolic. Oh. Right. This is symbolic. Again, back to what we did at the very beginning of this study with 144,000. In Revelation, symbolic. unless there's evidence to indicate that it's literal, we have to assume that it's symbolic. So this is symbolic. So what does Babylon represent in Revelation? Well, let's look at some verses and see. Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6. Uh, who are we at? Rebecca. We're back up to Jerry. I'm uh, sorry, Jerry, you're getting the long ones tonight. Revelation 17, verse right. 1 through 6. And then, Carmen, you'll have Daniel 4.30 after that. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me. And to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed full and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having in her golden, having in golden cup, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and nations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. I saw her. I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? You stop there, Jerry. We'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. I read one more. Yeah, that's okay. Now, we're going to study this in detail a little bit further down the road. But notice here it's talking about this woman, right? This, and it said she was a harlot, right? Yeah. She is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So when it's talking about Babylon in Revelation, it's referring to this power 
here, this, that, this power that leads the nations astray, the kings astray with the, uh, the, when it's talking about fornication, that of course is um, worship not the way God wants you. So it's, it's wrong worship. Well, so this is that that entity. Now let's look at Daniel four thirty. Daniel four thirty, the king spake and said, "Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty?" So notice in ancient Babylon. Who was the king glorifying? Himself. 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 Right. So Babylon, not only does it lead the nations astray, but it's all about glorifying man, not glorifying God. So those are some, some things you're going to see. Now let's look at page 321. Pastor Finley talks about this, paragraphs three and four. Revelation 14 describes two religious streams flowing from entirely different fountains, the fountain of truth and the fountain of error. Revelation's everlasting gospel represents the powerful truths of God's word to a world desperately seeking for meaning. The devil's counterfeit system termed Babylon is a distortion of truth and originates with the father of lies. At the time of the second angel's message, apostate Christianity seems ascendant. All the world will wander after the beast and worship it, except for those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The beast has power to kill those who refuse to worship its image. At the height of its power, Babylon's fall is announced by the angel. It falls specifically because it attempts to make men and women drink of the wine of the wrath of fornication. Spiritual fornication is unfaithfulness to God. All right, so the message here says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Uh, in the Bible, when a lot of times when you see that or phrase repeats itself, it's pointing to something that is about to happen, hasn't quite happened yet. So when John's writing this, this is something that's going to be happening in the future. Now let's compare this to Revelation 18, 4. I should get my finger in Revelation 17. Revelation 18, 4. And Kim. Kim, if you could read that for us. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. All right, so how does this verse tie into what we just read, the second angel's message? Telling me to come out. I mean, yeah, right, right. Come out of her. Because Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So it means it's falling. It, it's going to take a nasty fall. You need to get out. You don't want to be yeah. in Babylon when that happens. You know, when uh, the city of Babylon fell in Daniel's time, was that city a good place to be when it fell? No. So that again, when Medes and Persians came in. What did they do to all the officials? They put them. They put them all to the sword. It's amazing when you think about it. Daniel was not put to the sword, but something stopped. Him. I don't know if when they came in, they found out what he did. Uh, I mean, the fact that he stood up to the king at the last minute and basically um, told him that the Medes were going to, the Medes and the Persians were going to be taking a spot. So evidently appeared to be on their side. I don't know, but God definitely had his hand over him. All right. So this, there's God's people are currently in our day and age. There are many of God's people in this system of false worship that need to come out. 
which takes us to the message of the third angel, Revelation 14, 9 through 11. And Nicole's going to read that. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his, indigna his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. All right. So if the first angel's message was a call to worship the creator, what is the message of the third angel? It's not calling us back to worship God. What's it, what's it doing? Was it's basically it. judgment. Right? It's a warning of the judgment, right? So the first angel, the call to come back to worship God. The second angel was basically, you know, saying that this fault system's about to fall. You need to get out. And then the third angel is telling what's going to happen. So is, is God giving plenty of warning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, plenty of warning. So why are the consequences given in this warning so severe? Let's look at these consequences here. If anyone worships the beast an image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The wine of the wrath of God. Does that sound like a beverage you want in your cup? No. No, no, definitely not. Especially when we get down to the end of the chapter and we talk about the wrath of God. All right, so this is not a good thing. It says, um, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Again, that does not sound uh, like something pleasant at all. So why are these consequences so severe? Any thoughts before we look at what the author, what uh, Mark Pastor Finley wrote in the book? Well, they've rejected God. Yeah. They've rejected their creator. And he said he was a false god. A false god. Yeah. He always said he was a jealous god. And he, we were to follow him. All right, so those are some good points. It's a jealous god. Yeah, let's take a look at what past, Pastor Finley wrote. Maybe I might have some more comments after this, but it says, these verses are among the most severe and fearful found in God's word in the whole Bible, right? God is merciful, but he is also just. He is a God of truth. He can save to the uttermost, but those who refuse to accept his salvation will suffer the results of their choice. So here he's warning them of the results of the choice if they make the wrong choice. On the one hand is the wine of the wrath of Babylon's fornication. On the other hand is the wine of the wrath of God's indignation against sin. Again, it comes down to an issue of worship. The first angel urges us to worship the creator. The third angel warns of the terrible consequences of worshiping the beast. So he pleads with you to worship the creator. He warns you that hey, that system of false worship is going to come down, and then he warns of the consequences of worshiping the beast. I'm going to go ahead and read the next paragraph, too. It's really short. At its very heart, the mark of the beast exalts the human above the divine. It places humanity's word above God's word. It attempts to replace the commandments of God with human decrees. It promotes giving glory to humans rather than to God. All right. So it flounts all of that right in the face of God. So why are these consequences so severe? Well, it's pretty much like what Lucifer did, putting himself in the place of God, that a man's done that. 
put him and Lucifer got kicked out and this will just be the end. And God's God's justice demands okay. consequences for that action. And that that and if the, if the punishment fits a crime, that crime is pretty severe, so you know the punishment's got to be severe. Now understand this is not talking about the final judgment this is a judgment against babylon and its followers there's still another judgment to come so how does john describe drinking of the wine of the wrath of god he described it in verse um, sorry put up here in verse 10 is the, so he had says his which is poured out full strength in the cup of his indignation and then he follows it up with what Torm tormented with he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the lamb so right. it's talking about being tormented with fire and brimstone and in verse 11 it says in the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and uh so what does it mean when it says that it ascends forever and ever? And this is an important point to get straight because a lot of people, this is where they get the concept of the eternal hell, where people are burning for eternity. Let's look at some verses. There's Nahum 1.9. Where, where are we on here? Annabella. Annabella. If you can look up Nahum 1.9. Jerry, if you can look up Revelation 21. Three and four. Carmen, you can look up Malachi four verses one through three. Kim, Psalms thirty-seven verses ten and twenty. I'll look up Proverbs ten twenty-five, and then Nicole will have Obadiah. Yep. Okay. Nahum one nine. Nahum one nine. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it all. Affliction will not rise up a second time. All right, so here Nahum's telling us that God's going to make, says an utter end to it all. When he says it's going to make an utter end, does that mean it's going to keep going? It's going to have no. keep continuing? No, he's going to put an end to sin and affliction but if you have the wicked people burning through eternity in hellfire are those wicked people probably still sinning no well i mean if they're burning in hellfire they're probably cursing god which is probably i would think that would be considered a sin and are they being afflicted yeah yeah they're still being afflicted but he says he's going to put an end to affliction so if they're burning eternally, that can't be. Let's look at Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. All right, so look at the list of things he said he's going to do away with. If there are people burning for eternity in hellfire, has he done away with those things? No. 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 There's still pain. There's still suffering. There's still tears. Right? So that can't be. So let's look at Malachi. Malachi 4. Four. One through three. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be subtle. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness rise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall and ye shall thread down the wicked 
for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Right. So when you read that, that sounds like a reference to the same event, right? The, the burning uh, up of the wicked. But it says here that there's going to be nothing left. They're going to be what? The ashes, ashes under your feet? Under your feet. Yeah. So if something's been reduced to ashes, is it still burning? No. 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 It's been consumed completely. And then um, Psalms 37. Oh. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider this place, and it shall not be. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. All right. So it said there, the wicked are going to be no longer. Be no longer. They're going to perish, right? They're going to fade away and just be gone. All right, Proverbs 10, 25. When the, will, when the whirlwind passes by, the wicked is no more. But the righteous has an everlasting foundation. You see all of these references. Does the wicked will be no more. Now, Obadiah 16. For as he drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. So these wicked are going to be as though they have never, never been. been. They're just going to be totally gone. Right. So what are some ways the Bible uses the term forever? Let's take a look. We'll go through these together here. Exodus 21, 6. And you have to understand that this loses something in the translation to English. The Jewish readers understood what was being said and even the early christians so let's take to uh, exodus 21 6 i'll read this it says then his master shall bring him to the judges he shall also bring him to the door or to the doorposts and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever all right, so if we take this to mean forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, like some people do, then this would mean that this servant is serving his master through all eternity. Is that what the text means? No. 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 When it says here forever, it means as long as that servant lives. Right. right. As long as it, so these wicked, when they're cast into the fire, they're going to burn until they're no more. Right, until they are killed and consumed. Deuteronomy 15. Look at this one. Deuteronomy 15. Oh, that's 14. Here we go. 15 of verse 17. Very similar it says, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servant, you shall do likewise. So again, it's talking about obviously just until, you know, till death, basically. And then the last one we're going to look at is in Isaiah. Now, there are other examples in the Bible. We're just looking at these few verses because I, I don't want to take too much time on this. Isaiah 34, verses 8 through 10. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its stream shall be turned into pitch and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched day or night. Its smoke shall ascend forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. Now, obviously here, we're, you know, if you look at the Holy Land, is there a place over there where the land is burning still? No. No. We, there's no place over there where it's just a, oh, you know, can't go over here. You know, if there were something like that, it would be a tourist attraction, right? Yeah. 
And there would, there would be an overlook where you could, hey, come look at the eternally burning fire, right? The, the sea of fire. Well, they would could give us some kind of name like that. There's no place like that. The smoke shall ascend forever. All right, so the smokes, obviously, it's not still smoking. That smoke simply, it ascends until it's gone and is no more. So when it's talking about forever and ever in the Bible, you're talking about until you are no more. All right. Now let's look at Revelation 14, 12. Who's next? Annabella, if you could read Revelation 14, 12. Fourteen, twelve. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And this is the tail end of the third angel's message. What does this tell us about those who heed the message of the third angel? Those who hear and take to heart what it says. They keep the commandments of God. Keep the commandments. The commandments the of God of and the testimony the faith of Jesus, right? The two go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. But what does it mean that they have the faith of Jesus? Jesus believed in God you know, for, to, to death because he died believing and having faith. In okay, God. so having faith the way Jesus had faith. And it also means having faith in Jesus as our Redeemer, our Messiah, right? So let's take a look at page 323, last paragraph. It says, looking at those who overcome, John says, here is the patience of the saints. Most modern translation translates the word patient as endurance. I kind of like that translation because this gives you a little bit more meaning. God's people have been patiently enduring the trials and heartaches of this world, watching and waiting for Jesus to come ever since he went back to heaven. The Apostle Paul wrote words of encouragement to Christian believers in Rome in the first century. Those words have increasing relevance to this generation waiting for Christ's return. Do this knowing that... Yeah, do this knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. the night is far spent the day is at hand therefore let us cast off the works of darkness let us put on the armor of light i like that quote that's a nice verse all right so how does that relate to us today have to keep watch Keep watch. Keep enduring. We've endured for so long. We have just a little while longer. Right? You don't want to give up at the last hour. That would be a very poor time to decide that it's not worth it and you want to go enjoy the flavors of the world, so to speak. That would be a very, very poor choice. Right? So just hold on. We have just a little bit longer. And that brings us to the third section, Re Revelation 14, the final harvest. And we're going to do this like we did. The uh, 144,000 is going to be just a quick flyover. I could spend an hour on this easily. Uh, Revelation, where are we next? See Jerry? Yes. Yeah, Jerry, back up to Revelation 14. I'll tell you, let's mix this up. Let's not have Jerry read everything. Let's do, let's do a verse. Jerry... You start us off with verse 14, Carmen 15, Kim 16, Nicole 17, Annabella be 18, and then I'll finish with 19 and 20. All right. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, 
for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. That's a lot of blood. That is a lot of blood. All right, so the harvest depicts the conclusion of the great controversy. So we have this harvest. It's broken up into two parts. What? is depicted in the first harvest found in verses 14 through 16. Here you have the one that like the son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle. Well, who is that? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. All right. So who do you think Jesus, Jesus is going to be harvesting? Is he going to be harvesting his followers or is he going to be harvesting the wicked? His followers. His followers. followers, right? All right. So here we have the harvest of the faithful. Well, this is the harvest of the redeemed. Let's compare this to Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. Matthew 13. I shot right past it. The way to Matthew 3. That's a little far. All right. And I said, what verses 24 through 30? Okay. So it says here, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. All right, so you see the similarity here. Two harvests, you have wheat going to be gathered and put in the barn. And what's happening to the tares? They're getting burnt up. Right, they're going to be burnt up. When does this harvest take place? Well, if you stay in Matthew 13, Jesus explains the parable. We go down here to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus, right? The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. Or those are his children. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. So that's the wicked. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. All right. So when does this harvest take place? At the end of the world. The world. The end of the age. The end of the world, right? So at the second coming. Now, how does Paul describe the first harvest? In Jerry. Back up to Jerry. Jerry, if you could read this one, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. 
I like this verse. This this verse clears up so much doctrinal boo-boos that the other churches have. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air, and thus we shall be always with the Lord. Amen. I love that verse. That verse takes care of so many things. It addresses the state of the dead. It addresses the whole idea of a secret rapture. There wasn't anything secret about, about that. Coming with the trumpet of the archangel and the dead rising. I think people would notice that. Right. So that's a, a great verse. Now, how different is the harvest of the wicked? Well, if you look at Revelation 14 again, verses 19 and 20. So while the righteous are being gathered together by the angels to be taken to heaven to dwell with uh, Christ forever, let's look at what happens to the wicked. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God, and the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. What's happening to the wicked here? They're trampled, destroyed. They're being killed. They're, they're being killed. They're destroyed. So when that second coming comes, there's only going to be one group left alive, and they're going to be on their way to heaven with Jesus. Everyone else is getting put into that wine press and they're going to be killed. Right. So in both harvests, it states that the harvest is ripe. What does this mean? What does it mean that the harvest is ripe? It's ready to be harvested. It's ready to be, yeah. it's ready to well, be harvest, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that the, the people of the earth have made their final decision on whom they're going to worship. What happens if you try to bring in the harvest before it's ripe? It's no good. Yeah, it's no, no good. It's no good, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's no good. Yeah, you you wouldn't be able to use it. So that's important to understand that God is operating on his timetable. When the harvest is ripe, it will be collected. He doesn't want to come too soon because then much of the harvest would be wasted. Yeah. Much of those who could have been saved would be lost because he came too soon. And if he comes, if he delays and comes too late, what happens to the, the good fruit on the vine if you leave it there too long? It rots. rots. It rots, right? So you have to come at just the right time. So if you understand that, then you understand there's a time and a place, and we just have to be patient because God knows what God is doing. All right, so let's take a look at page 325. I told you we're going to fly through that one. Remember when we did this study a couple of years ago, it's been like an hour and 20 minutes on the harvest. Um, page 325. My fingers. Here we go. Last paragraph. Last paragraph? Yes, last paragraph. The book of Revelation presents us with two destinies, two choices, two masters, and all of heaven is appealing us to make the right choice. Understand there's only two. Only two options. There's no fence to sit on. Right? Jesus has done and is now doing everything possible to save us, to save as many as possible. Now the choice is up to us. Will we respond to the wooing of his spirit? Will we respond to his loving appeals? How can we possibly resist or reject such love? The decision is ours. Will you just now bow your head and commit your life anew to this almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful creator, God of the universe? I love how he ended the chapter. What does all this mean for us today? We have a choice to make. Yeah. We have a choice to make, right? Everybody on the planet has a choice to make, and time is running out to make that choice. 
That brings us to the end of this week's study. Next time, remember, it's going to be two weeks. No study next week because we're going to be at a prayer conference. And I don't think they would appreciate me setting this up and hosting our Bible study during the prayer conference. So we're not going to do that. We'll be back in two weeks to study Revelation 15, which is the first part of the seven last plagues. Now, remember that the seven last plagues are found in chapters 15 and 16. So Mark Finley is going through and just doing a chapter at a time. And we're going to follow suit. We're going to do the first half of the seven last plagues uh, in two weeks. And the week after that, we'll get the second half. All right. And as always, as we're concluding, if you uh, like more information on this Bible study or other studies, or if you have a prayer request, you can send them. Uh, there's my email on the screen, elderbobwall at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to answer those uh, and pray for you if, if you have a prayer request. But let's uh, close it out with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for the truth that we have in your word. We thank you for the warning that you have given your people. We thank you for the patience uh, that you have, that you give us the time to make these choices and come to the right decision. We thank you that you plead with us continuously right up to the very end, Lord. We ask that you will send your spirit to help us, encourage us, help us to make the right choice, and then help us lead others to also make that right choice for you. Amen. Thank you for asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank